Ah, ah, ah. Sorry, it's like we're doing the microphone sound check first. Ah, 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 ah. You've all come to join us at Dreamhaven tonight for a very special return um, to Minneapolis reading by I, your host and impresario, Brian Tawara. All right, and so doing the calculations, it is um, obviously 10 years since the you know, very first um, foreign book of mine on the other side of the eye came out here, thanks to a meeting very much like the one that you're assembled at here today. I had you know, met Tyree Campbell, my, uh, my soon-to-be publisher, at a Diversicon meeting, and um, let's see, and you know, we had gotten around to talking because I happened to be the you know, special guest of Diversicon 14. See, so, yeah, Eric, I'm really promoting Diversicon right now. I'm really trying very hard to do this. But anyway, like, you know, I met him, and he happened to be a Vietnam veteran um, who had um, served in Thailand and in uh, various parts of Southeast Asia as part of a journalism corps. And um, so he was one of the very few people that I had run into just randomly as far as being a bookseller goes who actually knew where Laos was. And so you know, he was going, well, what do you do? And I go, I write. Oh, and it's like... You know, what do you write? I write poetry. It's like, and, you know, and you know, the fact was that his particular specialty happened to be science fiction. And from you know, time to time, his other you know, specialty was a focus on science fiction poetry, and fantasy poetry, and horror poetry, anything that involved the imagination. And so, you know, my hamster wheel started spinning on this particular matter because I'm thinking to myself, well, Brian, let's see. You've been writing now a good 16 years or so, and while you have been published internationally at the time, then in you know, various you know, publications in Canada, in England, in France, Australia, Singapore, and so on, it's like you were having a hell of a time you know, getting published, you know, a full length book published in the United States. So we just had a, a very funny conversation you know, going on about that, which was that, well, your hands, like, you know, when your readers and, you know, audience members are talking about you know, ghosts of the past or you know, fear in the future or, you know, or the demons and, you know, and you know, spirits of, you know, of a different age. It's like, you know, they're thinking of one thing. And when I'm talking to my readers, it's like, that's quite another. And so we you know, hit it off and you know, it's like a few months later, he came back to me and said, oh yeah, this is very good. And so you know, the next thing you know, August 2007, we, you know, managed to release the very first book of you know, now American you know, science fiction poetry then, which as many of my, um, uh, many of my um, audience members have since pointed out, means that I kind of had that whole field locked up really well <laughs> there, as far as niche marketing goes. Alright, so anyway, enough of that part here. It's like I am, it's like I am happy to say both that that led to largely what I consider to be this you know, huge journey or on the other side of the eye, and also many doors that it opened not only for my fellow Lao American poets, but um, just our community in general. Um, there are today you know, close to 230,000 Lao living across the um, United States. Minnesota happens to have a third largest you know, population of Lao out here with um, approximately 12,000, depending on how you, um, how you, you know, count it. But you know, in that time, in the you know, four decades that we were here, there had been at the time you know, less than 40 books you know, in our own words and on our own terms, you know, been written by our own community members. And you know, I've since gone on to write many of those books. And hopefully, you know, as we look at it, you'll be able to see over the years, I've helped many others get a start on the path to, make, uh, to making their books as well. You know, the uh, publication of On the Other Side of the Eye, you know, in no small way led to my being eligible for the National Endowment of the Arts you know, Fellowship in Literature, you know, that, which then allowed me to um, have the freedom to you know, travel across the country to work with so many members of our community to see where were we going, who could we be, and what would you know, it matter for all of us. You know, let's see, with this, you know, with the publication of this book, it also caught a lot of people by surprise because they didn't think that Southeast Asians could write you know, science fiction or that. Um, you would you know, find a Southeast Asian voice in fantasy or horror. And so that was nice. It also meant that a lot of readers came afterwards and said, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, I guess I don't have to just write the, um, that's like the story of you know, the tea house of 10,000 pagodas and my very tragic journey from the old country to the new. Yeah, but I can actually go in um, some very, very experimental directions. Right. So it was a very liberating process. We 
you know, one from the NEA to um, form in the National Lao American Writers Summit to, in 2012, I had a chance to represent the entire nation of Laos at the 2012 London Summer Games. That, that was a, um, a very exciting moment in time for all of us then to see that there is this place for um, our work in our literature. But hey, enough of the introductions on that. Let's um, go in and see a proof of concept of what's going on in there. Hey, how are you? It's like, welcome, come on in. It's like, you know, there's plenty of space and seats here, and snacks too. So, open in the um, book on the other side of the eye, and, um, and you know, Dreamhaven has exactly yeah. one copy left in the shelves back there, so if you're really fast, you can actually probably snatch it up. The open into on the other side of the eye gave this introduction. From 1954 to 1975, a bloody civil war was fought for the future of Laos, the kingdom of a million elephants. The United States State Department and the CIA raised a clandestine army of over 30,000 guerrillas drawn from the highland tribes for the Royal Lao government's campaign against the communist Patat Lao, supported by the Russians and North Vietnamese. The guerrilla operation soon broke into open warfare. Near the end, children as young as 11 years old, were deployed on the battlefields alongside U.S. paramilitary advisors and mercenaries on the mysterious plain of jars, the sacred mountain, Pupati, the Bolivans Plateau, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and many others. With the U.S. withdrawal from Southeast Asia and the collapse of the Royal Lao government in 1975, thousands were forced to flee because of their roles in the war. By the beginning of the 21st century, over 400,000 of these refugees work to rebuild their lives in the United States, even as the world struggles to build a new future. Which isn't necessarily at the same power as that Star Wars opening for all, but I thought it was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> the opening poem then was, What Kills a Man? What kills a man? Always small things. Around. Holes. Fumes. Edges. Split atoms, a second, a footstep, a sip, a bite, a word, a cell, a motion, an emotion, a dream, a fool, a bit of salt, a drop, a fragment, a true root of arguments. What kills a man is mysterious only in how minute the culprit behind the blow. We're careless and forget, even when what kills a man is another man. It is a small thing that kills a man, a whole earth, a single grain on a sprawling table filled with the smallest things. first part of this all, which is door prize time. So, that's like, that's like, you call it, Vern, that's like, it's like, um, truth, dare, or trivia? Trivia. Trivia, all right. <laughs> it's like, first round, then, in trivia will be, what is the modern capital of Laos? Do, 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 do. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I was like, you can try it as much as you like here. It's like, all right. No one? No one? Have a seat, Eric. It's like we're in the middle of a trivia round. We're not breaking up anything. Eric, too, everybody. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, since we're having the fun interactive portion of this, we're doing oh. what, what? what is the modern capital of Laos? Um. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Next person. Can we have, have a lifeline? You can have a lifeline here. You cannot ask Siri. <laughs> Siri? It's like, wait. I'm asking Google. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wait, what's it's the difference? <laughs> Not much once the AI was finished sorting themselves out, you know that. You know that. Skynet is here. Skynet is real. Like, 
<laughs> oh, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take the time out to say, you know, yeah, point out to you know, Yuki Lau and the audience here. Yuki, wave, wave to the audience here, stand up if you want to. Yuki is the man who actually designed a very you know, famous outfit, some might argue, notorious cover for on the other side of the audience the way, way back in the day. Yeah. That's like, I remember getting some questions like, well, that's like, I was like, no, don't you think it's going to be a crochet putting on a dragon on the cover? And then it's like, it's not a dragon, it's, it's the Lao Nak. It's the traditional sacred symbol of our culture. Well, I was like, what about the face? Well, I can't tell you anything about that, but yeah, you know what? I kind of like it. Liliani knows. <laughs> okay, what does she know? Maybe. No, I Okay. Oh. Well, we have to move this along here, so we're going to go with, are you going to tell me what the character is, or am I going to have to give it the most? Okay, go ahead, Eric. Okay, so I got the answer. It's uh, the NTM. Hey, wait a second, so sorry, you got me. Who all agrees that he got beat out on the buzzer on that one? All right, yeah, this is the uh, very first T-shirt that ever uh, from a science fiction convention which had my name on it. Come on. I was like, someone, that's... Someone else got it. too slow. This is for you. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Oh, okay. Oh. That's, that's how the prize is going to work today. This is how these things work. All right. So, <laughs> okay, so one of the challenges when we're working with a, you know, science fiction poetry and speculative poetry is the question of, you know, for communities of color and for refugees, for example, how do we preserve not only our traditional stories, but also you know, to work with the stories that we run into, the science fiction and the fantasy that surrounds us, and also then possibly to create new myths and legends for our own traditions. But that's one of the um, questions we ask, and so that came up with my poem, New Myths of the Northern Man. Hey, get in, come on in, it's like we got everyone, we all agree we have some seats over here for them, right? <laughs> Good. So, this is my couch. poem. There's a couch. Yeah. yeah a whole couch. Uh-huh. Go for it. Hey, Bernie Lee, everyone. I used to train her, and she's going to finish her book any day now. <laughs> any day now. No pressure. Right. No pressure. <laughs> New myths of a northern land. Dream, I said. Aren't you tired of making new legends that no one but I ever hears? Bones, she said. Aren't you ever tired of asking questions that only I can answer? I went back to bed, waiting for the new king to arrive, his talking mirror filled with dire pronouncements of flame. Now, this next poem is one of the ones that kind of became part of my signature style over the years here. It's entitled, Aliens. We turn our dishes to heaven, but what manner of dog will come running to lick them, drawn to the censored moaning groins and the pyrotechnics of false death and chemical love? Fetch me a big stick to shake at these stellar voyeurs. I want nothing to do with them as I run down my strange streets. An accidental alien without a ray gun. You were there when I first tried that poem out in the community years ago. <laughs> but, uh, so, one of the challenges has also been about how do we bring in the Asian American story. Back. And um, when this first came out, um, Edward Cox, a, um, in, a uh, reviewer in England, actually took the time to take a look and read through the whole copy of On the Other Side of the Island. I appreciate you very much for that. <laughs> Eric, but um, let's see. And so he believed that the poem Five Fragments was you know, a central poem, however, that really kind of um, tied together what we're trying to do. So this is you know, that very poem. Five Fragments. Only seven people walked away from S21. My critics asked me to find the beautiful words to make this more than a statement. Chase the rhythms and meter and propel this into true poetry. Aesthetics mustn't die in literature. Don't starve language with your emaciated lyric. Don't keep back the flourishes that will set these words apart. For anger and memories will become only passing wind. And the tattered spines of your book about this camp will be thrown in the garbage without even the pomp of a Berlin book burning. Surely, the 14,000 would appreciate that who have no eyes, no voice, no hands, to applaud and cheer. They want me to splash in Paul Potts' rivers to find the true tears from mere fallen rain. 
But if you ask my neighbors across the hall, you will find a particular indifference whether I succeed or not. When the B-52 bombers pummeled Nhat Luang by accident, over a hundred Khmer died without cause, with no more ceremony than a shrill whistle and a burst of flame and shrapnel from a mile high. Ambassador Swank came to assuage the grief of those who survived with a grand gesture of $100 bills, American. A woman I know from a village near Angkor Wat tries to escape the nightmares at the camps today by filling her house with tropical trees and flowers from her homeland she remembered as a little girl. In 1990, over an after-school match of Trivial Pursuit, my teacher asked, What is the name of a country where Pol Pot instituted Year Zero, killing thousands of his countrymen? Cambodia, I answered with certainty, confident and familiar. No, he replied. No? What the hell is it, then? Picard, says Count Uchia. That's the same thing. No, it's not. Ten years later, I can't believe I argued over that point as I stare at crude wooden tables piled with skulls near the non -pen. And finally, in two years, I don't believe I've said more than a dozen words to my combined neighbors in the apartment below me. That's just the way it is. The other day, I walked past the grandmother, trying to talk to her Hmong counterpart across the hall. Broken English, hesitant and uncertain, had become the bridge as each stood in their doorway, fumbling towards something resembling an ordinary conversation. Gardening and grandchildren seemed to be the subject. I still don't know what to make of it all. My head heavy as a mango, without a mouth to feed. And so, that was what we were working with. And that was one of those heavy poems that instead makes me feel like, all right, round two for, you know, door prizes. Then, <laughs> okay, which poem, it's like, which country was by fragments of, uh, primarily about? If you were, this is the test to see if you were listening. <laughs> Yes, the last poem I just read, which country will we be talking about? Hey, are you, is that, is, are you hinting? <laughs> <laughs> Munchkins? Anyone, anyone? It's like, I've got a lot of door prizes up here. <laughs> yeah? What <laughs> country? Okay. Yeah. Oh, are we going to take that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Yay! <laughs> All right. So I just got back. From, it's like you know, it's kind of funny. This um, whole trip back um, from you know, California was this kind of you know, combination of Mad Max meets you know, <laughs> it's a Mad 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 world. I feel like. <laughs> as many of you were following along, it wound up being that I started out in Los Angeles, had to run down to San Diego to grab something real fast, then run all the way back up to uh, my colleagues in you know, San Francisco, say hi, then we found ourselves in Portland in the HP Lovecraft bar, which is a very, very strange place, but I understand why <laughs> Portland gets to have an HP Lovecraft bar. That's like, <laughs> now, did not go there, did not go, edit that out, edit that out. Um, let's see, then we went up to Seattle for the National Lawmaking Writers Summit, and I was on my rush all the way back to join you for convergence in here in Minneapolis, only to find out that I was going to be seven days early and then found myself you know, trapped in um, in San, uh, South Dakota, <laughs> <laughs> and I found out that was also the day that I found out. Wow, you can do what, everything in South Dakota in 24 hours. Everything, everything. And so I found myself here, and then you know, made my way down to, you know, surprisingly enough, my very first international Godzilla convention down in Chicago, and that was 
you know, very fun here because there's nothing that's as amazing as walking into a convention of a thousand people here who all love giant lizards like Godzilla and say, hey guys, I'm going to talk to you about the powers and the joys of speculative poetry. <laughs> but we made, a, we made a very good run at it. And so one of the poems I had a chance to read at, and this is also in, you know, in memoir, it's like apparently this month, you know, we lost one of the um, classics, and the young son actor um, who played um, the very first Godzilla, um, as a matter of fact. Um, and you know, when you watch that first Godzilla film, you see Godzilla just pumping all around you. Did you know that? It's like, do you know what that soup was made out of? Concrete. Concrete. It's not rubber, people. It's concrete. <laughs> this man was running around in a concrete suit because rubber was too hard to get a hold of uh, thanks to the war. And, uh, you know, he's stomping around and he's saying, I'm doing my best here. It's like I could be playing Shakespeare, you know. But, <laughs> <laughs> not only that, it wasn't made for him, so it didn't right. fit him. <laughs> you know. But that's how we've always artists in, in the world. <laughs> and so this is just a, um, it's like, this is a song that, or the, um, a poem of mine that had appeared in you know, G-Fest magazine you know, 11 <coughs> years ago then. Uh, and up until on the other side of the eye, it was the largest collection of my poems all put together in one place. So I was kind of tickled about that, even as I'm going, well, what are we doing to our American literary history here, where we're just showing up <laughs> in, you know, Godzilla magazines and <laughs> all that. Here. And it's like, oh yeah, no. It's like, next week, no, who knows? Maybe someone will take on zombies next. But, <laughs> all right, so. Zombie anthology. <laughs> Son of a kaiju, ladies and gentlemen. Through foam, through surf we rise, dark waters parting as our titan's foot breaks the shore. Armies rise against us with a roar, guns blurn in the night. Our cause, our fears, our fight is for historians alone to decide. We, fierce combatants, have no time to reflect on our footnotes remarks. In raging moments, fists become claws of small tales lost beneath the crushing might of epic bloodshed, cities toppling amid the screens so out of touch with time. Turn back, turn back, turn back, you mighty beasts! But deaf ears mark our reptilian hearts that sag and sigh in thin our wake. The tragic years untold unheard, trampled upon the world stage. This isn't Shakespeare. We are no Moors, no witch doomed Scots we know. Our loves are not the songs of poets, for we rise to a fever beneath these scales, following our instincts, man-made hurricanes, mad as that monster Typhon, filled with a simple potential of half an atom. So I'm happy that you're all joining me here because this, you know, coming into September, I'm also about to mark the very first um, year of my term as the president of the International Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association, which is, yeah, it's a, it's a mouthful. And we're going to celebrate our 40th anniversary um, next year here, and you know, in this process, it's been wonderful um, traveling and talking to all of you, you know, about you know, how much can poetry change a person's life, and particularly the um, poetry you know, that deals with science fiction, with fantasy, with the imagination. You know. And surprisingly, one of the first publications that ever gave me a shot at this was a um, journal you know, run by you know, Deborah Kologi, who was out in California, and I didn't know it at the time, she was also the president um, before me by about two or three terms, who had, um, that's like who had started up a journal called Astro Poetica. And this poem is called Little Bear Osa Minor. If they skin you, will they find a tiny man with eyes the color of stars? Or a paw, fury and crimson, fierce jaw yearning for some cosmic salmon, longing to scamper across the great longitudes and latitudes of night against the axis of a mother's boundaries before winter arrives in the heavens. Moaning to forgotten gods a child, watching Sirius from afar, daydreaming of a man, daydreaming of you, 
from his basement as he discovers a distended Orion telescope during spring cleaning. Memories awake, stretching with a hungry yawn. poems from, collected from all around the world to kind of put together this constellation you know, <laughs> of poems. And I thought that was an ambitious project, that, you know, the idea that you can look at these stars which we've mapped and we've charted you know, and still say there's space for us to add our own voice to it. I think that's a powerful idea. So, ooh, door prize time. What should our next door prize be? Or, let's see, or rather... Your goggles. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, not this time around. No, okay. So, up on the next round here is the copy of Starline uh, 39.4, which is the um, official journal of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association, and this is also the one in which it announced that, hey, guess what? Brian is now the president of the Science Fiction Poetry Association. <laughs> and it's also the only copy I have, so this is actually kind of a you know, fun historic thing, so please, people, take, it's like, take good care of it, as many of you remember you know, me posting up on Facebook the other day. It's like, you know, you know the original copy of On the Other Side of the Eye goes for an ungodly sum of money you know, <laughs> right now. That's like, and my poor sister, you know, <laughs> it's like but her kids just mangle it all up. I feel bad for it because it's moved. Sorry, sis. It's like, but I gotta bring that up. Anyway, so. All right, so. All right, I was like, we're gonna do this for fun way. I'm thinking of a number. What number is it? Between one and ten. Eight. No. Four. No. Seven. Seven it is. <laughs> all right, then. That is predictable. Okay. So. We, uh, I'm happy with On the Other Side of the Eye because it also allowed us to play around with the idea of you know, how do we bring Minnesota into the field of science fiction poetry. So this is a poem called An Archaeology of Snow Forts. <laughs> There's not much to be said some well-washed stone hasn't heard before. History is composed of broken walls and bad neighbors. Just ask these chips from Berlin, the Parthenon, and Café or these cool magma hands of Pompeii, dark and gray. If you listen carefully in the right place on University Avenue, you will learn there is a minor wall near the Yalu River, dancing on the hills of Chin for the moon. Who knows exactly what I mean in every tongue worth mention? She's moonlighting as a curving garden serpent, coiling around old Leokoa, a suspicious one with his astute eye, pruning of a sly wink. Come, touch true history, and how the moon must laugh when she spies the tiniest hill in Minnetonka, where the small hands of the earth have erected a magnificent white wall, a snowy miniature marginal fort raised some scant hours before, already melted into a hungry, roiling river who is not yet finished eating Louisiana for brunch. <laughs> Just a few more here and then we'll get to the cake, which is the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> mm. All right, we were doing well with the, you know, with the number guessing video, and I've got more door prizes than I thought I was going to have. You give that away? What? <laughs> oh, <laughs> hey, no. no, we're giving pins on this side of the table oh, right first. Yeah. Actually, no, no, Kip you're John? right. We do yeah. actually have something. <laughs> All right, so, let's see. All right, let me think here. No, this is going to be a trivia question. All right, and that will be... This creature doesn't normally... It isn't normally found in Laos because we tend to burn our bodies. What creature is it? I know. Oh, okay. What is it? It's not even fair, I suppose, but you're going to tell us, aren't you? Zombies. All right, good. Yay! And they give you so much because, you know, someday the baby will run around wearing 
<laughs> no, no, actually, it's like it's that's like I, that's like I have this whole story from the CIA secret war about you know people cutting off ears here, but isn't appropriate for young children in the room here. But come to me afterwards; I'll probably tell you. <laughs> okay, so let's see. My first trip back to Southeast Asia after coming into the United States was in uh, 2003, and that um, journey was in part searching for my long lost family. And along the way, um, here, this is the um, part where this is the um, ghost story portion of the um, poetry reading where I, I found myself um, traveling from temple to temple, but also I found myself increasingly running into evidence of a, of a traditional Thai ghost um, in the region known as Nan Nak or Men Nak. Um, and, and the um, Finn was with Pepe Thai even have a temple to her. Um, uh, near one of the rivers, you know, uh, and the trick is, is that they don't see Nanak as a horror story in many instances, but a love story. It's about a woman who um, loved her husband who was away at war so much that um, <coughs> even though she died giving you know, birth to her child, you know, she came back and waited for him to come back, and then got a little bit angry at everyone when they tried to separate her because, you know, this ridiculous rule about the living and the dead can't um, have a home together, and she just didn't buy that. <laughs> well, as I, needless to say, you know, at the, uh, at the temple, you know, then it became kind of interesting. People kept praying to this you know, particular ghost then to give them all sorts of things, to help them in childbirth, to you know, protect their soldiers during war, and so on. And I found out that um, she's actually, you know, that's not her specialty. Um, what it turned out to be is her specialty is in family reunification. And I really didn't come into understanding that until just a few weeks later. I found my long lost family after 30 years, and we've been in touch ever since. And so, as part of that, um, in almost every book that I write, then, it's like, you know, I have to have at least, as part of a bargain, I have to have a, a poem involving not nothing. So, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> the ghost, Nan Nak, hates the draft, isn't very good on issues of fertility, but isn't too bad with the lottery if you pay your respects properly by the Pakyang trees. She's eaten diced mangoes with a mouth of ebony ants, kept company by a TV tuned to tacky Thai soap operas, surrounded by white mutts who hate black dogs of any pedigree. Wants a simple life again to set down the Buddha's yellow candles for just a minute. But she has a lot of karma to pay off for trying to keep her family together, spooking mischievous children at night who think she's looking for playmates or her beautiful baby, toddling <coughs> between Bat Mahabad and the Pakanon River. So, I mentioned earlier that part of the um, journey with this book was also taking a look at the science fiction that um, we had also walked into, and one of the um, classic figures that I, I spent a lot of time responding to, um, one of our diverse time guests, Minister Faust, always took, oh gee, Brian, it's like when it comes down to um, Lao poets, you know, Lao, Lao, like Lao poets writing you know, science fiction poetry involving H.P. Lovecraft, yeah, you've got that market all locked up. <laughs> yeah. And so, H.P. Lovecraft you know, created this whole you know, universe of monsters and creatures, <clears> and, you know, of uh, it's like, you know, of varying levels of fear and terror, and one of the entities that he had were these creatures known as the Deep Ones. And the Deep Ones turned into being one of the more popular poems from my collection. It's been apologized in you know, books such as um, Future Lovecraft, um, let's see, uh, what's the, um, uh, like How to Live on Other Planets, and uh, a number of other anthologies. And I think I'll just go ahead and read this until you'll see why. The Deep Ones. From the sea we come. <laughs> From the sea we come. Our mouths, the ends of the world. The salt of the earth, unwelcome at the tables and charts of explorers who expect commodity and fine territory. Kingdoms, not wisdom. Blood, not heaven's children. We grow with uncertain immortality at the edge not made for man. Bending, curving, Humming cosmic, awake and alien. Our mass, a dark and foaming mask, a bed of enigma to certain eyes. One with the moon, one with the stars, one with the ash that whispers 
history in the same breath as myth and gods whose great bats yawn before us as we change with a growing tongue, growling amid the dreamlands. We built one blade, one leaf, one golden wall at a time. this up with uh, two final poems, then we'll get to the fun part of cake and extra door prizes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, okay, let's see. Okay, it's like um, we're going to play um, intelligence agency trivia. It's like to see who is paying attention for the next door prize, the cop a new co a copy of Starline here. So, which intelligence agency you know, was most involved with the Laos secret war in the 1960s and 70s? In the CIA. All right, CIA. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the bad bit. Good. See, now that is that. That's the right stuff. And that leads into our poem, Democracia, or Democracia, as you can see. Father was a tiger, <laughs> ground beneath the wheels. His path was burned to light a torch. There's no liberty here. Only the ashes of a village that couldn't evolve, where ghost grandchildren play with ghost grandparents, and the parents are nowhere to be seen at all. Where have they gone? Where have they gone? A delay of a day for an idea, a delay of a lifetime for the dead upon the ground. Look what remains. This hut hasn't the ambition of King Ozymandias. These craters were once a rice field. This ox was no man's enemy. And what we have left behind to say could explode any minute. All right, let's see. We've got a couple of fun ones here. All right, we're going to bundle this one up. Then, and so, South Dakota, what, it's like, what is one of the most famous animals that you can run into in South Dakota that's legendary? Jackalope. I hear a jackalope in the back. <laughs> it's like, yes, it's like, that is correct. It's like, okay, if you have won yourself an official jackalope hunting permit. <laughs> 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 like, we'll have you at that thing. Yeah. 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 Later on. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, fine, it's like, let's see. All right, I'll tell you what, I have enough fans of, you know, of Japanese you know, pop culture out here, and we also need to move some of these door prizes. That's like, all right, then, who is getting his very own theme park in the very near future? He makes a lot of animated movies. It's Hayao Miyazaki. Oh, and it's like, yep, Hayao Miyazaki. Oh. And so you get... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Tell you what, this one will be an easy enough one here is who is best the sugar baby, uh, uh, the sugar lady uh, version of? Rosie the Riveter. Uh, Rosie the Riveter it is. Hey, whoa. Okay. All right. Nice. That's a two for Yes. Oh, she's doing it. Oh, okay. Yeah. That All right, great. Right. Yeah. So, we're going to close this out then with the poem Zelkova tree. The Zelkova tree is an interesting tree you know, found in Korea. You know, and, and, uh, what, uh, and I'm closing it off with this one simply because it's the um, poem that you know, appeared in the very first issue of Cha Magazine, a Hong Kong journal, you know, which is also celebrating its 10th year here. Hey, Tammy. And the um, idea being that, um, no, it was the first time that they were had, um, really thought that they could form a, a literary journal in Hong Kong. And, you know, they kept at it. And now, um, you know, just, um, I'm really impressed that they've got, you know, just, you know, I think close to 40 issues or more out there. So, you know, like this is you know, what I really want you all to walk away with afterwards is that, you know, you never know, you know, just sharing your words and your ideas with other people, you know, what will happen, what gets transformed, what gets changed. It's like even as you, know, you find your success, you can be a part of other people's success too. Reach for that. Don't be afraid of it. Zelkova tree. A friend warned me the other day not to write about the Zelkova. 
or I might come back as one and find myself cut into furniture, just as Ben started to get interested. The other day, Ms. Alcoba warned me not to worry about my friends, or I might stay human and find myself cut in furniture, just as Ben started to get interested. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've been a wonderful audience here. Official Lao American Artist Heritage Month <laughs> proclamation from the Governor of Minnesota here. So this is the supporting artists like Samoka Bonsai in the um, in the second row here as, as she makes her journey and she's actually delivering the next generation of Lao American artists you know, for us, we presume, or else he's going to become a really awesome mechanic, huh? Or a cow. Or a zombie hunter, something like that. Zombie hunter. Zombie right. Creative. I was like, all right, some of you haven't seen it, but in the time that I've been gone, I also picked up Book of the Year from the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association for my second follow-up book, The Monster. Well, do we have a few copies of The Monster there for sale here? Oh, oh, they were supposed to arrive, but I was like, well, we will just correct that on the next incredible reading that we do out here. So, that guy? The what? green guy? The green guy? Oh, that's just Caputo. He just hangs around here. It's like, in fact, no, it's like, you know, all right, so I will tell you the funny story about that is that, all right, so I'm trying to, it's like I had to go to Boston recently, you know, before I came all the way back here to Minnesota, and so... You know, I, it's like I was dropping off a mutual colleague of ours, sent many rats about at the airport, you know, then because he said, hey, it's like, you want to go to the airport together? Yeah, sure, what time is it? Like, four? Okay, what time is mine? And it's like, oh, yeah, it's five. Yeah, sure, I can drop you off. And then, you know, then I find out, oh, you're leaving at 4 a.m., and I'm leaving at 5 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's like, okay, well, what am I going to do? It's like, well, why don't you go to the uh, Mall of America? Here and you can grab yourself a um, you can grab yourself a you know, a bite to eat or something like that. And of course, this one of those days the mall doesn't open to ten, but you know it's like I went around and then I finally go over you know, there and it's like and I kid you not, guys, it's like I was actually dressed like a civilian. I was totally not dressed in my standard poet outfit, <laughs> you know, running around here. It's like you know t-shirt, you know, it's like you know t-shirt slacks, and I had my luggage with me. But as I'm there, it's like all of a sudden it's like. You know, the, um, this guy in little biker shorts and the little badge comes up and he goes, Hey, do you have a minute? Can I talk to you? And I'm like, oh, oh. It's like and I'm just ordering a, um, a, um, a bad Philly cheesesteak <laughs> at the time. Which, you know, I didn't think it was that suspicious. But, and, and, you know, so he then asks, you know, why were you here? And, you know, in the um, process, it's like, no, I, just, I decided, you know, I see where this is going, so I told him. Well, good, sir. In 1954, the United States decided to um, violate the Geneva Convention here, and it set in motion a, it's like a um, secret conflict here that set over um, 400,000 refugees um, into the United States. You know, like an hour later, um, as we're still talking about this, he then asked, do you mind if I have a look in your bag? <laughs> it's like, and so... I, it's like, you know, what am I going to do? It's like, yeah, it's like, and so, yeah, that's when he discovered, oh, <laughs> it's like, here's Ryan's hat, and, oh, what's this? Why? It's funny that you should ask. <laughs> and then he just said, no, go on your way, sir. <laughs> All right, so, let's see, um, I would be remiss um, on this here if I didn't do one last door prize, then, and so, yeah. But it's like, we got to make this a good one because, you know, let's see, one of the projects that we did was we worked with um, Noah Son of Onsai mm -hmm. um, to help him establish one of the very first Lao American publishing companies. And, you know, I was so happy that Noah agreed to join me on this particular project because when um, we did, it was, like I said, um, fewer than 40 um, books in our own words on our own terms, ben, and he helped to add one in. You know, ben, and he's, and he's actually followed me along on these you know, crazy ideas like, oh yeah, maybe the um, now imagination does matter. So this is a broad side of, you know, of a poem that we did together called Full Metal Hanuman from my book The Monster, which isn't here right now, but the significance of it is that it is also the first you know, poem of ours to win the Reader's Choice Award of the Year from Strange Horizons magazine, ben, and it was his very first science fictional award you know, for, you know, for being a part of a, um, a poetry project like this. So this is that broadside, and now we need to come up with a, um, uh, we need to come up with a 
worthy, you know, worthy and interesting, you know, thing for to give this away. So, who thinks I can name three of my books? I've got six, but who can name at least three? That's all I'm asking for. Three. No one works, you don't count. <laughs> That's Okay. All right. Yes, you can try to Google it real fast, but the other people are much faster on the Google who than you. I'm telling you that. Go for it. Go for it. Okay, Farrell. Uh, Farrell. Uh, on the other side. Of the on the other side. Yeah. Well, you have a five. All right. Very good. All right. You're keeping this one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you've been a wonderful audience, but now this is the part we've all been waiting for, which is Kay over there. So thank you, and I'll see you soon.